Welcome everyone to our April 2023 session of AZ Bio Peers. And today we're talking about money and specifically how treasury ma management impacts your business. It's very pertinent topic after we've seen um, challenges in the banking system, especially for people like Silicon Valley Bank. Um, but we're not gonna focus on that today. We're gonna focus on your business. What are the liabilities? What are your responsibilities? And what are some of your options um, in managing your money? So with that, um, I would like to welcome um, Bardia Moraidi from Snell and Wilmer. And um, he is going to be my um, wingman today as we go through these issues. Um, and so um, Bardia, you and I have spent time together, but tell the crowd a little bit about who you are. Yeah, thanks. Thanks so much, Joan. So it's good to meet everybody. My name is Barty Amoyeti. I'm a partner at Snell and Wilmer. I'm also co-chair of our life sciences group here at the firm. Uh, my practice is really uh, more of a corporate traditional Silicon Valley type practice. So half of what I do is I work with startups and venture capital firms, everything from formation through convertible note, seed, Series A through pre-IPO funding rounds. And the other half of what I do is mergers and acquisitions and IPOs. So exits for companies like yours. Um, uh, Snell Wilmer, if, in case you don't know, is a uh, firm of about 500 lawyers across 16 offices. And so we have a pretty national presence with um, corporate IP, litigation, real estate, basically a full service firm. Awesome, thank you so much. And you know, we're thrilled to have an expert in the legal side of the business. Um, but everybody, just as a quick disclaimer, um, neither myself or Bardia are providing legal advice today, um, nor are we providing you with financial investment advice. So this is more of a discussion on what the, the, the structure is and what your options are but always talk to your personal um, legal and financial advisors. So with that, um, going back to other financial crises, um, you know, everybody scrambled to make sure that their money was properly protected. And then they forgot. And that goes through cycles. I mean, we've seen that every time, whether it was the dot coms in 02, the banking crisis, um, you know, in 06, 08, um, or the surprise that we had in 2023. So um, just in general, I am a business owner or I run a business, I own businesses. I am responsible for my company's money. What are my responsibilities and what are the things that I need to be aware of? Yeah, that's a good question, Joan. So um, coming from a person, by the way, I, I actually used to be in banking and investment banking. I was at Merrill Lynch in basically from 2007 until 2011. So I, I was at Merrill Lynch in 2008 when I went to I went to sleep on Friday and I woke up Monday morning as a B of A employee and i was watching the the financial markets kind of collapse around me so this 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 bank collapse with silicon valley bank was unfortunately the second time i had to kind of go through it but um it's funny how quick we are to forget about what we what it is that we need to do so as a member of the board of directors or as a corporate officer of a of a company the directors and officers owe a duty it's called a fiduciary duty to not only the company itself to act in its best interest, but also to the shareholders of the company. So you owe a duty to the, to the company and the shareholders to act what's in what's in the best interest of the company and the shareholders at all times. And with that duty comes this duty of what's called oversight. So um, there was this there's this case that was pretty pretty prominent. It was it was a Delaware case called Caremark. And what what happened in that case was the courts came out and said hey, look, you have this duty to oversee the financial affairs of the company to make sure that there is good treasury management and uh, in a way that benefits not just the company, but really protects the shareholders. So to that end, what we all need to do as kind of good, good stewards of corporate governance is 
really look at where our money sits, why it's sitting there, and decide, is there anything I can do that would make this a better or safer scenario for the shareholders and the company by way of where those funds sit? So I'll, I'll pause there, Joe, before I kind of get deeper into it and let you kind of navigate where, the, where you want me to take this. Great. So, you know, one side of it is our fiduciary responsibility for making sure that the money that we have is safe and secure and available when we need it, um, which we call liquidity, right? Um, but there's there's also, you know, the reasons why as CEOs and officers with these fiduciary responsibilities um, that, you know, what happens if our money's not available? I mean, the Silicon Valley bank customers, some of them, you know, woke up on Friday and went, oh my God, and didn't know what was going to happen on Monday. What are some of those liabilities from an operational perspective? Yeah, no, that's a good question. So, so unfortunately, if you woke up on Friday morning to not having any money in your bank, and let's say you had done nothing about it up until that Friday, then you were behind the ball by way of good corporate governance and, and responsibility. In other words, we got word that Silicon Valley Bank was in trouble probably late Wednesday, actually probably Thursday morning. So at that point, alarm bells should have gone off and there should have been some discussions at the executive level, if not the board level, as to, um, hey, we should be monitoring the situation. We should look at our accounts and see, hey, are they are they in an FDIC insured account? Um, is it is it a, do we have money above the two hundred fifty thousand dollars insur insurance limit at SVB? And kind of started to come up with options as to what we would do if SVB was to collapse. Um, so, sorry, Joe, going back to your question, could you just could you just repeat that for me again? So, you know, from an operational perspective, right. okay, I I can't I can't get my money for thirty days. Yeah. Or I can't make my um, my tax payments. Yeah. Or you know I can't pay my people. On one side, it's uncomfortable, but on the other side, you got legal responsibility. Right. Yes, and that's a good point. So a lot of the issues that came out of the collapse, which was when we when companies did not have access to their money after Friday morning, it was really quickly became how is how is the company going to make payroll? How is the company going to pay the payroll taxes? Um, how are we going to pay vendors? Um, all, all those things kind of came into question. And what we saw the government do was they said, hey, look, <clears throat> we're going to give you a reprieve. We're going to give you a little bit of a furlough with respect to the employee, the employer taxes or employee taxes that are due on the withholding amounts. But in, it, it, there was no time in all that collapse where the government said, you know, you don't have to worry about making sure you make payroll on March 15th um and and paying your employees you can hold off on that they never said that and so that's one thing that we should all take away from this which is if you don't have good treasury management and you're in a situation again where all the funds are just frozen out of your company you're still going to be liable as the, as a corporation to pay the employees to pay the wages of the employees who are working for you and, and to take it one step further the law really is favored um towards the employee such that if you're a director or officer and you know that your employees are working and you have no way to pay them then there's this there's this theory this legal theory that if you allow those workers to pay knowing that they cannot be paid as a director and officer you could be personally liable for those wages so even though you've set up this corporation or this llc and you've and you've limited your liability in that way because you're now a separate entity the government will look through that. The courts will look through that entity and look and, and pierce that entity and look to you personally and say, hey, Bardia, you knew as CEO, you knew as a board member that you couldn't make wages on the 15th of March. And so for that reason, because you let your employees work, you're going to have to pay out of your own pocket to get those wages over to those employees. OK, so so as we look at these you know the shifting sands and there's been discussion about you know the the legal system and then also the banking system and the various structures that are available um you know sometimes and, and i know this was the case with silicon valley bank with some of their um clients so many banks 
make their money by being lenders. Whether they are commercial lenders, retail lenders, credit card lenders, et cetera. In the case of um, large lines of credit with a bank like Silicon Valley Bank that's so focused on the tech and, and life science industry, um, very often you would see, yes, we'll loan you money, but you have to keep it in our bank, which then automatically puts you overweight. How do you deal with that? I mean, from a contract's perspective, that's a legal issue. Yeah, no, you're totally right, Joan. And, and obviously this whole situation really put a spotlight on that particular provision in these loan agreements. So just as Joan mentioned, one of the conditions of getting a, like a loan facility from Silicon Valley Bank or, or one of these venture lenders is typically, hey, you have to put 100% of your deposits into our Silicon Valley Bank accounts. And I don't think before this collapse did we really focus too much on that provision. I mean, Silicon Valley Bank was a strong bank. It had been around for 20 years. Nobody really thought that there could be a scenario like we saw in March. But now that, that we know it's a possibility, I can tell you from the deals that the venture debt deals that I'm helping clients negotiate today, we're taking a much harder stance and a much closer look at that legal provision. And we're trying to cut it back. And we're making the argument now that, hey, look, we don't, you know, you may not be Silicon Valley Bank, you might be, you know, Joe Schmo Bank, and you've been doing this for 50 years. But we still have a fiduciary duty to make sure that we don't have 100% of our cash locked up in your accounts because who knows what might happen tomorrow. And if something does happen tomorrow, we need to be able to go back and access our funds and be able to really stand behind uh, our decisions with our shareholders to say, no, we have, we have access to capital. And so what we've done now in order to negotiate that term is to say, hey, look, we'll, we'll keep you know, a majority of our funds or a certain percentage of our funds with you at Silicon Valley Bank, but we're not gonna keep 100% of our funds. We've also started to negotiate a little bit further and say, hey, look, if, for example, we see your, you know, if you're a public company, if we see your stock price dip by X percentage um, between the time we sign the agreement until, you know, the, that date, then we can start to peel away certain funds and start to allocate them to other accounts. Um, you know, and, and that's just kind of one way of dealing with it. Another way of dealing with it, which I'm sure Joan probably knows a little bit more about than I do, is, is to look at the actual account that you have your money in at those banks, because there's more than just money markets. There's, there was, you know, if you, if you were lucky enough to have a, an account at Silicon Valley Bank that was called an insured cash sweep account, then at the end of the day, whatever money you had in that insured cash sweep account was being swept into another account so that you had $250,000 increments across multiple accounts, whereby you, you could have had up to $125 million in this SDB federally insured. Yeah. So that, that's a really good transition to, to what some of the options are. Um, so when we look at ICS, right, which is, and, and different, um, banks have had different relations. The smaller banks mostly are with Intrafi, which is a, a financial services company that manages these transactions with the banks. And these are um, very often um, a series of money market accounts in different financial institutions. So basically, <clears throat> a bank that, and we'll, we'll use the Intrafi network as an example. So AZ Bio Banks at Alliance Bank of Arizona as one of our, our banking relationships. And so they have an option, um, which is ICS. And so with this intercash service, they will sweep the funds. So if our general account hits that $250,000 limit, then they have set up accounts at other financial institutions on our benefit where that money is, is, is then farmed out. By doing that, um, we keep everything within that $250,000 limit, um, but we still have a single banking relationship. And that is with Alliance Bank, which is part of Western Bank Corp. Um, and that means that they are managing those protections behind the scenes with Intrify, but I only have to deal with one bank. I'm not looking at, 16 banks every day and having to check and see, okay, well, I need to move 
this much money from bank A to Alliance so that I can make payroll. And I need to make this much, take this much money from bank B and do all of the balancing. They do it for you. And these are banking relationships. So this is all within your own bank. Another option, um, which you may hear of, is Cedars. So Cedars is um, like ICS, so it's moving it around across multiple financial institutions, but it's using certificates of deposit as the primary, as opposed to a money market fund. And so because CDs are timed deposits, um, those deposits may have restrictions on how long it takes to actually get the money and move it someplace else if you have to sweep it. So what you very often will see is people with, you know, operating cash plus 25, 30%, um, not in the tens of millions of dollars. They're probably gonna be in an ICS type of structure with a bank. Um, now let's say that you are a company that has a very healthy balance sheet and you actually have a year of operating cash in reserve. That's where you may wanna look at Cedars or another financial institution where you're gonna get a better return on that money. Going back to that um, fiduciary responsibility, that duty of managing money, it's not just your duty to keep it safe, it's also your duty to invest it properly, right? Putting it under the mattress is not considered a good idea either. And I can tell you, based on my past life at public companies, if you have too much money in the bank that's not you know, providing a good internal rate of return for the corporation, the street doesn't like that either. So, so you have to balance where, how you use these financial vehicles. So um, you know, as your deposits grow, the first thing you do is you ask your banker um, what options do you have for multiple bank insurance, for sweep accounts, or other financial vehicles? And then work with your banker. You can look at what your cash flow um, history has been with the bank and say, okay, we think that you might want to move this much over here, this much over there, so on and so forth. So that's how you do it with banks. Now, banks are not your only option. So um, what we've seen, and we've all heard of the fintech revolution and all of the things that are happening in the fintech world, and one of the leaders in you know, starting to move that way was Brex. So Brex is a fintech company. They are not a bank. They started out in credit card services, and then they, made, they expanded into cash management services but they operate as what's called a broker dealer. So they are working across multiple financial institutions, um, both at the regional, the local, regional, and national level. For instance, Chase Bank is in the Breck stack. Um, and there, they will manage the transactions using technology. But the big difference between a financial stack like Brex and a bank is Brex does not blend. The credit card operations are completely separate from the from any commercial lending, whereas a bank, a lot of their income comes from commercial lending. So, so where SVB got in trouble was they had a bunch of stuff that was either in long-term deposits accounts or in commercial lending. So when people started to get nervous because of some financial disclosures and started to pull on their cash, SVB couldn't get cash out fast enough. The same thing applies to your company. So as you're looking at the different vehicles, what you want to think about is how your cash planning and your cash flows run. And so you can afford to have X percent of your money in accounts where you need instant access. You can have X amount of your money in your accounts where you have two-day access. You have X amount of money in your accounts where you have 60-day access or longer. It really depends on your cash flow history, that timing of money combined with 
um, your responsibilities to ensure that the corporation's money is secure, that you can meet your liquidity requirements, and that you have a reasonable investment return at the various levels where you're keeping your money. So would you agree with that, Bardia? Yeah, I would. I absolutely would. Yeah. It, so, yeah. so as we look at these um, new relationships, you know, we saw money flying back and forth. Um, you know, on SVB weekend through ACHs and all kinds of other financial um, vehicles, you know, when depositors and, and if some high profile individuals hadn't started putting the word out, wow, this is a potential problem, go get your money now, we may not have had a run up bank. I mean, there have been other banks that have been overweight in their lending before. Um, but not everybody is in the inner circle to be told to go pull up those funds, right? Most of our small businesses don't have treasury managers or CFOs. So who are some of the other professional services people that can work with our, our small companies, right? To, to help guide them. Who, who are those people? Yeah. So, I mean, you have, you have um, different, consultants in different roles who can actually play a huge part in in helping you manage what you're doing. Sometimes it's your payroll provider. But Joan, you probably know better than I do because you're closer to it. But um, I've seen CPAs come in and and act as almost like a fractional CFO to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. um, but again, I, I defer to you on that one just because you're so close to it as as an officer yourself and director yourself. Yeah, we, um, I mean, I, I have um, a, a blessing and a curse relative to AZ Bio. Um, the blessed, the the curse is as a CEO, I have to manage a relationship with 36 board members. <laughs> That's a really big board, and luckily, the blessing is we have a phenomenal. But um, our board is really designed intentionally to make sure that we have skill sets that. Um, complement the needs that the corporation has. And in our case, you know, we have over 275 member companies. Those companies employ over 300,000 Arizonans. That's a big responsibility to that many people to make sure that we're properly taking care of, of the funds. And so, um, you know, our board includes attorneys. It includes accountants. It includes um, business CEOs who have been there and done that. Um, and we make sure that we have the right um, partners that we're working with to help guide us in those things. So for instance, um, you know, relative to um, you know, payroll, you know, we have a payroll processor that we work with and they pull the funds directly from our accounts. They advise us when there are going to be changes in the law that may impact what's happening with our funding and our flows from an HR perspective. We also have partners like ADP who can work with our um, partners and our members um, relative to things like tax credits, because you know the tax credit landscape is changing dramatically right now, as we know, relative to R&D expensing in particular. That was a very nasty wake up call for a lot of people who either didn't realize that that was going to expire at the end of 22 um, and that, you know, you'd be respond, you wouldn't be able to to do that expensing anymore. Um, and, and while there are a lot of people, including Senator Sinema and Senator Kelly, that are trying to fix it, it's not going to fix it retroactively. So, you know, having those financial advisors that can guide you on those fiduciary responsibilities. I think are really important, but lawyers play a big, big role in that too. Yeah. Yeah. And, and thanks for that, Joan. And, I, and, and a couple of things I just want to add to what Joan said, and it's because she's made some really good points. One is, is that with biotech companies and, and, and startups of your stage, you, you know, you typically might see a scientific advisory board, but that's not, that shouldn't be your only advisory board that you have. So a lot of times startups have a separate advisory board that's separate apart from the scientific advisory board and separate apart from the board of directors. 
whereby you have industry professionals that, that Joan was mentioning, seasoned CEOs, CFOs, who kind of act as, you know, almost like a, like a, like a lifeline where you can pick up the phone, you can call your advisors who are really just consultants and say, hey, have you ever dealt with something like this? What would you recommend I do? Um, that, that's, so that's one important point, which is, I think it's, it's probably um, lost a little bit on, on biotech companies because we're so focused on the science and the scientific advisory boards, is to really also make sure that you put in place a good just general business advisory board like other startups do. And then, oh, go ahead, Joan. Yeah, and, and uh, I, I, I personally, you know, as both a, a, an investor and, and a, um, an operator of companies for over four decades now, um, uh, having your advisory board, having a kitchen cabinet where you can reach out to someone and say, can you give me a piece of advice on this, right, is really important. I, I can tell you that on SVB weekend, <laughs> Um, I th spent the entire weekend on the phone as just about every advisor and and, um, and board member did. And um, but the other thing that's really, really, really important to protect you as a founder and as a CEO is you need to have more than just advisory boards. You need to have a fiduciary board with fiduciary responsibilities. That means that you have a board that can fire you as the CEO. When boards don't have that authority, when a CEO has too much control in a company, you can make mistakes. And, you know, in our industry, probably the poster child for that mis the, those mistakes was Theranos, right? Where you had an executive te team with controlling um, stock position and the board was basically not providing the oversight that it needed to provide. And so when we look at situations like this, another way to protect your interests and to protect the company's interests is to have a real board of directors with fiduciary responsibility. Because an advisory board, which is basically your friends and colleagues telling you what they think, but you don't have to do what they say, is not going to provide <clears throat> the same level of protection. Is it, Bardia? No, you're totally right. Right. You're totally right, Joan. So, so Joan's emphasizing the importance of an independent board. And the importance of an independent board is also emphasized by SEC rules. So if if you ever look at if you ever pick up what's called an s1 which is a registration statement that a company has to file in order to start trading publicly on nasdaq nyc or what have you you'll see that there's there's some big disclosures in a company whereby there's a there's a management team or sole shareholder that owns a controlling stake or has majority power in a company versus a company that does not and so in other words you can just tell by the landscape of the rules that 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 require if if someone has too much power, you have to make so many additional disclosures to let investors know that hey, this person really doesn't have that much oversight. This person can um, there's not much independence here. This person can really rule the day. Um, Facebook is a good example of that company. By way of biotech companies, there's a couple of companies that that were um, created or, or founded or run by somebody named Patrick, Dr. Patrick Soon Xiong, who he's, he's the richest person in LA. He's got, he's got a few, few companies like a Braxine and whatever else. Um, and if you look at some of his companies called Nantworks or Nant Health, or uh, and what used to be called Nant Quest or Conquest, all those companies have these significant disclosures in their public documents saying, hey, look, this person doesn't really have that much independence. He, he really rules the day. And to Joan's point, what you're doing when you consolidate all that power yourself, you're really putting that much more risk on yourself because if something goes wrong then the law and the courts and everybody the shareholders are all going to look to you as the ultimate decision maker since you were pretty much the domineering uh voice in all those decisions so independence is well, yeah and if i'm patrick and i've had multi-billion dollar exits 
which he has, right? He can afford the lawyers to cover himself. Yeah. Um, but if I'm a small company CEO and I need every single penny to go into my science and my people, nothing personal about it, but I don't want to be giving it to the lawyers. Yeah, no, and you're, and you're totally right, and you should be. Look, so I'll, I'll tell you this: when when SVB was falling, and we got the first signs of that, um, I have all these alerts kind of set up as as my role as a startup venture lawyer to make sure that I let my clients know, hey, these are the things that are coming down the pike, <laughs> and just to be careful. And so, your your attorney's role is really important in all this because. You've already paid them a substantial amount of money to get them to get your company to the point where you're at now. And and you should have someone who's working alongside you as an advisor, as an, as an attorney who can who can really kind of reach out to you. And I was reaching out to all these clients and even people who weren't my clients, just people in the community saying, hey, look, here's what's coming. Here's what might happen. Here's what you need to do. Here's here's what what everybody's saying is kind of a good practice by way of mitigation and, and diversification and treasury management. And so I would encourage you, like Joan has said in this in this last five, 10 minutes, is to really surround yourself with good advisors so that you're you're not all of a sudden hit with a monumental case or lawyer costs. You're just you're basically doing you're, you're spending a little bit of money up front, making sure you have good advisors around you so that you don't come and face this giant lawsuit or fallout from um, maybe a decision that you could have gotten ahead of if you had good advisors around you. So um, government, right? A lot of our life science companies, especially our smaller life science companies, live in the world of grants, right? And some of those grants have upfront payments and some of those grants are back-end reimbursements. Um, but in the case of upfront payments, there, there's a lot more legal liability for the company when you're holding Uncle Sam's money, right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, so again, yeah, you know, I have a lot of companies who will take grant funds and actually put them in a separate account mm -hmm. so that there's a proper accounting and you can see every dollar in and every dollar out from the NSF or from whatever it might be. Um, and I, and I think that's a great idea because you want to be able to trace every dollar that, that, that was given to you from the federal government. And because look, when you have, when you have those opportunities where you get those non-dilutive funding, and non dilutive funding in those in those grants, there's restrictions on not just how that money is used, but also where that money is actually where that money sits. And your and your lawyer should help kind of guide you. Your corporate attorney should guide you as to what you can and cannot do with those funds. But it really starts with first making sure that you have those funds segregated and you can do a proper accounting. So that, by the way, so that if anybody comes and looks at it down the road. And, it, and more likely, it's not going to be the government who comes back and takes a look at what you did with those funds. It's it's an investor who's going to be investing a substantial round in a substantial round in your company and is doing diligence and is saying, hey, wait a second, we're doing our business diligence and we saw that you really commingled a bunch of funds. How have you been using this NSF grant when it should have been used only for research, but it looks like you've hired or done other things with respect to, you know, what have you. Yeah. And, and we have to kind of peel that back and it makes it makes it a lot harder. Right. And and as an investor, the reason we're asking those questions is because that creates a liability against the company if there is an audit or another challenge um, that would then deplete company funds and put my investment at risk. Exactly. So that's you know, that's why they look at that. So as we um you know, continue to move forward. Uh, and by the way, you know, the example of, of, you know, putting the funds in a different place. So AZ Bio administers the Flynn Bioscience Entrepreneurship Program. And we actually have those funds in a separate account at a separate bank. Um, so the only thing that that's for is that account and that, that grant. And we can pull the bank statement, we can hand it to Flynn in the case of an audit, um, which, you know, as a foundation, private foundation, they have audit rights on the grant. And, um, you know, if there were an audit, we just simply take them, take the bank statement for that account and say, here it is. But if we've commingled it with all of the other AZ Bio accounts, 
um, there's very little transparency and there's a big audit headache. So um, I've been looking in the chat and you guys are pretty quiet right now. So, um, so Barty, I've been asking you questions. Yeah. I'm gonna let you turn the tables, <laughs> okay? So I am a CEO um, and I am building a business. What are some of the questions that you wanna ask me? Yeah, no, so actually one question that I really wanna ask you is, can you tell us a little bit how you handled the SVB situation? What are the proactive steps that you took once you first started hearing about um, that SVB might be in trouble? And, and even though maybe you didn't bank so much at SVB, but you had other banks where you had your funds that might be kind of similarly situated or at least grouped together by way of category or industry, um, what, did, what did you do? What were the steps that you took? So, so the first thing that we did is we looked at where our various accounts were um, and um, where we might be overweight. So one of the challenges of running an organization like AZ Bio is we don't have a steady income stream. We tend to front load our income in the first quarter because that's when most of our member renewals come up. And so we were overweight. Um, so the first thing that we did um, is we happened to have a Brex cash account already. We didn't have to open one. And we had our um, accounts with our traditional banking partner. And so it was very simple for me to say, you know, I just think this would be a good idea. You know, opened account, opened my, my online banking and said, send an ACH for X amount of money from bank one to bank two. And the next morning I woke up and it was in bank two and it was covered. Okay. Um, we did look at, um, because I didn't necessarily want to have our um, Flynn Grant account um, you know, involved in all the sweep activity and things like that. It kind of defeated the purpose of having that really clean statement. So we, we, I reached out to Flynn and said, um, would you be okay with us setting up a separate account in a separate bank? That particular grant always comes in right around the $200,000, $250,000 number. And so we simply said, okay, um, you know, we're going to go with a quote unquote, you know, national bank. Um, in this case, we chose Chase, right? Who, you know, if there's a short list of the quote unquote too big to fail banks. So we went over to, to, to Chase, we opened an account at Chase. And that's now where we hold those restricted funds. So we have very clean accounting. Um, on the other side of it, we were talking with our executive committee every day. So you know, before I started making unilateral decisions, I reached out to our chairman. Then we talked with you know, the chairman and the vice chairman, and we brought the treasurer into the conversation. When we wanted to open a new account, we had to bring our corporate corporate secretary into the, into the equation. New resolutions had to be written. All of those things where you could act nimbly had to be done. And we had it done quickly, right? Pull the trigger, get the restricted funds out, move, the, move something over. And we're still having conversations with our bank about the best way to meet our three primary goals, which are safety, liquidity, investment income. And so our banker, who's been our banker for over a decade, is working with us to, to look at even more options. So, and, and Joan, I mean, it sounds like you handled it pretty darn well in, in, in a way where I would have been happy to hear that's the way you handled it as, as a corporate attorney who, who deals with companies like yours. And so one, one point that I want to emphasize for everybody was what, what Joan mentioned uh, with the way she, with, with respect to how she just handled the SVB situation was she brought as many people under the tent as she possibly could at the executive level. Meaning in a situation like that, I can't, I can't emphasize enough the importance of over communication with your, with your board of directors and your executives 
And the reason for that is twofold. One is, is that by Joan being overly communicative with, with other folks and getting their insight, once she's able to provide a better solution for, for her company as, as a fiduciary to, to um, her company, and two, also, is she's, she's also really limiting the risk that she's taking because she's not doing this all in a vacuum by herself. So where someone can come back and say, hey, maybe that wasn't the best decision. Well, Joan didn't make that in a vacuum by herself. She, she, took, she took a reasonable effort to include the people that need to be included in those decisions. And collectively, they came to what they thought was a, was a good course of action or the best course of action at that time. And if anyone were anyone were to challenge what you know Joan's decision making in that in that moment, um, or you know after it was all done, looking back in hindsight, <clears throat> the courts would really favor Joan in that scenario because she did do what she did, which is she did take the time and effort to get multiple viewpoints, and based on the facts that was in front of her and the executive committees, they made a reasonable effort to do what they thought was in the best interest of AZ Bio or the company. And so I can't emphasize the importance of that enough. Uh, one other thing too, just, just to be mindful of is as CEOs, I've heard this from so many different founders, whether it's a startup, late stage, mid-stage company. As a CEO, you feel this weight on your shoulders where you think that you have to solve every problem by yourself. Yep. And you almost become reclusive and just shut down and pour into yourself all these decisions and all these thoughts and whatever else. You need to actually get past that and do the opposite. You need to do what Joan did. And as hard as that might sound, it doesn't all fall on you. Yeah, you're the leader, but a good leader knows when to tap their advisors and their executive committees for help and insight. And, and really, it's going gonna, it's gonna to help you from a stress level. And it's also going to help you from a corporate governance and fiduciary level. It's it's really really beneficial and it's really really hard to do it, but it's definitely something that you need to do. Thanks, thanks, Bardia. So, would you please tell um, our board member at Snell and Wilmer that I did a good job? <laughs> I will. I will let Cody know. Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, so we're coming up on the the fifteen minute mark, and I do want to be respectful of everybody's time. Um, I don't see questions in the chat, so we're going to keep going. Um, did you have another question for me or should I throw one back at you? Why don't you throw one back at me? Okay. So I'm, I'm starting my company right now. Um, what are the first two or three things that I need to do other than, you know, have my science, but just formal foundationally, you know, who are the, the three or four um organizations that i need to put in my kitchen cabinet from the very beginning yeah absolutely so so one is i would tell you you need a good corporate lawyer um you need a good lawyer just in general for for corporate formation someone who's done work with companies and seen them from from start to exit and beyond so that they can navigate you as to hey this is kind of what the normal range of um shares are that you authorize and issue out here's kind of what you allocate for an option pool if you're gonna if you're gonna bring on advisors or employees down the road um also someone who can connect you with a good intellectual property lawyer and, and usually like the corporate guys can can find you the ip folks and whatever else um so so an ip obviously the importance there is to making sure that you protect that technology or that proprietary information that you're really going to use to to scale and build your company and what people are going to invest in. Um, that, that's one. Two is if you have any co-founders, making sure that those co-founders are the ones that you're going to want to get married to for, for some <laughs> period of time. Um, and, then, and then third, it's really the advisors and the industry experts, someone like Joan, who's connected in AC, AZ Bio, who can, who can really give you some guidance and, and perspective on companies that have come through, that have succeeded, and companies that have come through and struggled. And what they did so that you can benefit from from one their mistakes but also their their good decision making so you can apply it to yourself uh and actually I would, I would actually stress the importance of that one the most which is getting plugged into a university incubator or or an organization like az bio basically a group that is in the industry that you're in and that is facilitating companies and their growth 
in the in the way that you are trying to do it yourself it's going to open a lot of doors for you not just to not just to advisors and decision makers but also eventually investors and so getting as plugged in as possible is is the best recommendation i can give great thanks and you know one of the things that i always looked at um as a corporate executive a business owner a founder and now a nonprofit executive is when i'm picking my professional services partners my lawyers my accountants my regulatory people etc i want to have the best talent and skills that i can afford but i also want to have a partner who's going to open up their address book and help me make connections because they spend a lot more time dealing with the other professional services people than necessarily I do as a startup CEO. How can um, a firm like Snell and Wilmer or a firm you know like um, EY or, or whatever, how, how do those companies um, provide services over the, the textbook? You know, here's the law, here's the the, the tax yeah no so so um again if, if any one of those organizations for example snell and wilmer we have a pretty robust life sciences group so we have we actually internally here at snell have monthly meetings where our life sciences practice practice group uh, not just the leaders but also the practitioners all get in on a call on a zoom and we talk about recent developments in the biotech space recent develop recent developments in the startup space and the funding space and we really come up with, um, we really kind of sync up with what's happening in the community. And, and most of that really is to make sure that that knowledge that we have gets consolidated and organized so that then we can pass it down to our clients, pass it down to startups and, and companies like yours so that you're benefiting from the wide range of information and companies that we're seeing and how they're adapting to certain situations or how they're going out and getting funded and or how they're going out and, and developing and, and, and overcoming regulatory hurdles. And so whether it's ENY for accounting or if it's Snell and Wilmer for legal or, or whoever it is, you wanna make sure that you have a, a, a group or a company that's, that's really just entrenched in what you're doing so that you can benefit from that. Because essentially you're gonna, be, you're, gonna be paying a, you're gonna be paying a lawyer, you're gonna be paying an auditor. So why not making sure why not make sure that you're going to get the most information you can and the best breadth of knowledge you can from from those folks great and that's really good advice folks because um you know just as we talked about you know in a crisis situation you have to be able to pull in as many advisors as possible um don't forget that just because it's a lawyer or an accountant that you know they don't deal with a wide range of people across the industry and very often can be major connectors for you yeah. um and, and i always picked my professional services partners based on how willing they were to be a connector yeah. so the other thing and and um, there was a question or a comment that came up in the chat um you know as we were talking and that was okay i didn't even find out about the SVB situation until Friday, and then it was too late. So, um, as as we started off, right, we've seen these situations before. We start to clean up our act, and then everything's going along smoothly, and we forget, and then we kind of slide back into at risk situations. Um, just kind of in closing, um, you know. Hindsight's 2020, we can always say what we should have done. But looking forward, what are three things that the people on this call or the people watching the video later can do today um, to start to lay a, a, a stronger foundation for their business so that they may not be surprised by something like this in the future? Or if they are surprised that a bank or another financial institution does have a problem, they're adequately protected. So it's not their problem. Yeah. What's your what's your top three, Bardia? So my top three is right now. Number one is probably look at your current roster, whether it's your current board of directors, whether it's your current executive officers, whether it's your advisory board, scientific advisory board. Look at everybody that you have around you, and really assess 
kind of in the last month and a half, two months, when, when things started to kind of go a little bit crazy, who stepped up and who did what? And not to say, oh, well, this person didn't do anything. They were out of the picture and we should get rid of them. That's not it. This is a good opportunity right now to reassess who you have around you and really now communicate to them, hey, look, when when SVB collapsed and I didn't know about it until Friday morning because I was busy running my business, I, I really was caught flat footed. And to an extent, we were all caught flat footed. Um, so now let me communicate my expectation of of what I think certain advisors should do, because you have time to focus on different things outside of the business than I do as CEO. And I would say, I would love to have you, let's say Bardia or, or, or Joan or whoever your advisor is, I'd love to have you be kind of our market leader where you're looking at developments on a day-to-day -day basis. And you're, you're coming back to me and saying, hey, look, there's a couple of things going on that you should be aware of. So right now, I'd say number one is look at your roster and look at who you have around you. Um, and I can tell you again, as as um, as things started to develop on Wednesday afternoon or Thursday morning for the SVB, I I was the one that was looking at MS, MSNBC or CNBC or what have you, and and I was kind of keeping track because I have companies that are at the public stage and I can see their prices fluctuate, and I also have a lot of private startups companies like yours where where I need to be in tune with these things so I can provide that knowledge to my clients. And I started reaching out to all my clients and saying, hey, this is something to be aware of. We should probably schedule a board call. So that's my number one. Okay. Uh, do you want Can to I do a number two? Well, how about, how about you give us one that you think is uh, really important? So I, I think that this is a great opportunity for us to go back and look at our foundations. So specific to what we are talking about today, which is treasury management, I would say number two is make an appointment with your banker. And if you don't have a banker, you need to form a relationship with a banker um, so that you can you know, pick up the phone when you need them and they take your call. Um, but more important, you're not you know, stuck in a, a continuous vo uh, voice response to unit loop. Um, but more importantly, your banker is there as a professional services partner to provide you with options, but they're busy people. So if you don't ask, they don't tell. And um, so put on your to-do list this quarter to meet with your banker. Number three. You just took my number two. <laughs> uh, number three is to, I mean, honestly, it would be just to stay calm. Uh, don't be reactive and try not to be reactive, try to be more proactive. So again, one thing that we can learn from what happened with Silicon Valley Bank and, and the last kind of really the last year of the financial markets with when Ukraine you know, when Ukraine was invaded and the stock market collapsed and funding slowed or the, or the biotech IPO funding or, or, or window kind of came to a little bit of a hiatus uh, or a pause, we should look back and think, okay, where, where, where was I in the stage of the company when these things happened and what could I do now? So that could be prepared for the next time where let's say we're caught a little bit of, with a surprise of, of, of a lack of funding or um, uh, a surprise in the market that's going to drive kind of a decision later on where you can so if you can get ahead of it let's get let's get ahead of it meaning like okay where are we in the bank with with the with how much money we have in the bank and do we need to start looking at some cost cutting measures where are we with R&D strategy and are we putting enough resources behind that to get us to the next inflection point if the funding window is open now so we can make sure we get those dollars in? So it's, again, it's really just now looking more towards the future based on what we've learned in the past rather than not learning from the past and just being reactive in the moment and, and perhaps doing something that, that really long-term isn't gonna be beneficial to you. And I think the last, um, as we start to wrap things up, I, I think the other thing that's really important is we talk about transparency. Um, now, there are some who have said that it was an, an extensive amount of transparency by the CEO of Silicon Valley Bank that triggered the bank run. Um, personally, I'm not really sure that that's case. I, I wouldn't have phrased public statements the way he did, um, but the reality is that the numbers were already in the data. It was not a surprise, 
right? They, they had a financial imbalance in their balance sheet as the interest rates can started to go back up again. So um, one of the things that I've read in the marketplace is you shouldn't be transparent. You know, you need to keep your cards closer to the, the vest. If we look at cases of oversharing, maybe there was some oversharing at SVB. If we look at undersharing, there was definitely undersharing at Theros. Um, so, you know, with that, in, when, when is the important information? When is material information? Um, who are some of the people that a CEO can talk to about what they should be sharing and what they should be keeping more private? I'm um, sorry, cut out a little bit at the end, John. Oh, sorry. So, you know, I'm a CEO and I'm looking at some significant, possibly material issues. Maybe I'm a private company, right? So I don't have the same level of disclosure that a public company does. When do I have a responsibility to share what may not be good news? And when should I be, you know, keeping it close to the the vest while I try and fix it? Yeah. So who, who can I talk to about that? Yeah, look, I would I would talk to your board of directors about that. That's why you have this. That's why you have these seats at the table with with folks that you can trust, so that you can come to them and say, Hey, look, uh, maybe our financials aren't looking so good. Maybe we got some some results back from our our preclinical trials or whatever it is, where it doesn't seem so rosy right now. When you go to those, when you go to that board and you go to those people and you share that information, they're gonna basically be able to tell you based on their own experience and their own knowledge that, hey, this is kind of how I would handle it. And after you kind of consolidate all that information, you can kind of decide, well, okay. And we, it's again, it's an open conversation. Do I need to go tell my investors? Do I have a duty to go tell my investors that, hey, maybe this, this product candidate that we have is really not gonna be a product candidate anymore? Or is it too early to do that? All, all these conversations happen at that board level. And then what's, what should happen is um, a message is put together with input from those high levels and you can decide, you know, you can, so you can have, have renditions of a press release or communication that you all think really works. And I would actually have your lawyer look at it too, to make sure that you're not saying something that would be an admission of guilt or an admission of liability in some way that could be used against you. Good advice. Yeah. And we are right up at the end of the hour. Bardia, thank you so much for a great conversation. Um, I hope everybody enjoyed it today and stay tuned. Uh, we've got another um, Easy Bio Peer session scheduled for May and we'll be talking with you soon. Bye, Thanks. everybody. Thank you. Thank you.